industry and in particular the sort of peculiar lens between chemical weapon development and, and medicine, which isn't immediately obvious that there would be such a link between trying to kill people and trying to keep them alive. And also a little bit of history about how I became an academic. I thought that may be of interest to, to the young minds out there amongst you. Um, so this first slide here has got two molecules, and then it will be a very organic chemistry um, type of uh, talk tonight. And these molecules um, I was working on 20 years ago, I guess. Um, so this one here um, I was involved with, and uh, it's a heartworm um, drug called collie dogs. I was involved with that as an undergraduate, and that really is what triggered me uh, to uh, told me that I really wanted to work in the area of natural products chemistry. So this is a, a compound derived from a natural product, derived from natural mineralizing, a fermentation product. Um, and like I say, it's, it's a, actually a drug of dogs, the common dogs. Um, and this molecule here, um, so from my undergraduate days, working at Smith Club Beach, and this, I went on to do a PhD at the University of Bristol. The first molecule I worked on there was this molecule here, the saxitoxin. And saxitoxin um, is, um, I guess, a, a bit of a pest. It's, uh, it's the cause of evasion of parasitic shellfish poison. So if you eat some bad shellfish, um, this stuff can be in there. It can kill you. It's not very nice at all. In fact, it is on the chemical weapons uh, list uh, because uh, the CIA used to use it in Cold War um, as a, a, a last resort suicide agent for the spies, which is why I've got these columns here. So the spies were issued with hollowed out uh, columns in which there would be a uh, needle and some of this agent in there. And it's so potent you need very, very little indeed to kill it. These days the columns have had a bit of a renaissance and they nicely fit. Micro SD cards, so if you want to take your secret documents around with you, uh, you can now buy with these uh, columns, uh, these spy columns. Uh, and use that. So that's why we've got this picture, not the needle, but the micro SD card. Um, so, <coughs> like I say, my, my sort of chemical career almost started in, uh, with this chemical warfare agent, and then more recently I've moved into uh, drug discovery. And so, the two talks kind of together. So, if we go back to the sort of, um, I guess, the 15th century when the Spanish uh, and others were investigating and trying to find the new world, uh, mainly due to the spice industry, actually, that was the, the real driver back then. Uh, I get a factory issue. <laughs> it was found would paralyse the, the soldier if he, if he got shot with it. Um, and so they're a bit more fearsome than they hoped. Um, <clears throat> so the poison actually came from one of the local uh, native vines which grew up trees and the, the sap of these vines was a black oily substance you can see here. And uh, <clears throat> it contained um, some potent neuro a muscular blocking agent called tubocurarine. So this, this sort of uh, oily goo is called curare, and you would uh, get the sap from the vine, you'd dip the end of your poison dart in it, and use blow darts then to, to try and uh, attack 
presumably originally uh, it would have been for killing small animals to eat, uh, but later it became one of the first chemical warfare agents against uh, the Spanish soldiers. So a lot of this talk is going to be a little bit about the nervous system and I apologise to the neuroscientists in the audience because the biology here is going to be very basic. Um, I'm a chemist, I don't really understand biology very much. <coughs> but uh, there are a number of different neurotransmitters and this one here is called acetylcholine uh, and that works, um, well, well, we'll find out how that works in a bit. And of course we've heard of adrenaline and noradrenaline. These are involved in the sort of fight or flight response. Presumably once upon a time when we were um, roaming around uh, the savanna, if we had uh, a lion chasing after us, um, the adrenaline would kick in. We all know what that does. It makes your heart go faster. It stops defecation and urination. If you've got a lion chasing you, you don't want to do a Paul or Radcliffe. Um, <coughs> you need to run away. So <coughs> this one in particular, acetylcholine, will, will come up in the talk quite a lot. And uh, here is a, a very basic idea of the, the neuron um, part of the nervous system. So like an electrical cable, uh, we get an excitatory uh, response at one end. We get an action potential that fires an electrical impulse down the electrical cable. The string of sausages here actually jumps from node to node. And then at the end, it comes to a synapse, a synaptic uh, junction. And at that synaptic junction, the signal gets passed on not by electricity, um, but it gets passed on by neurotransmitters. So here is a presynaptic terminal. The electrical signal comes in. That triggers these vesicles to open and to release neurotransmitters. And they diffuse across the synaptic gap to whatever's on the other end of it. It could be a muscle for instance, and there are a whole number of receptors which receive these uh, neurotransmitters and if you get enough signal uh, building up from receptors docking in here then you get uh, the transmission of that, that message. That message could well be, um, I've put my hand on a kettle, it's hot, <coughs> take it away, it could be move your arm you stupid person, that's hot. So they come across here, they're docking here, and of course when you're moving your arm you want it to stop at some point, you don't want it to keep contracting. And so there's this molecule here, this uh, enzyme called acetylcholinesterase, and that's in the synaptic gap and it's there to chomp up the excess neurotransmitters. So the neurotransmitters are, are constantly going on and coming off, and if you get enough of them docking you get enough signal uh, to make this uh, something happen. And of course, as they come off, if this is uh, chomping them up, then eventually you drop to a level where there's no longer a signal and your, your muscle stops moving. Right, so tubercurine actually acts by mimicking the natural ligand acetylcholine, the natural neurotransmitter. And it, uh, instead of using both the cationic interaction and the uh, hydrogen bonding interaction of an acetate group, it actually spans two cationic sites. And that means uh, two things. One, it's, it's provoking a response, but because it's, it's spanning two sites, if one of those comes off, odds are the other one's gonna, gonna still be on. And so it's more likely that the second one will come back on again than the whole molecule diffuse away. So it's quite a long lasting effect and the Spanish soldiers died because their respiratory system stopped working. They, they suffocated, essentially, um, because this is a very long-acting uh, species. <clears throat> Sometimes, however, we might want to completely paralyse something. So if we're, if we're a surgeon and we're doing surgery on a muscle or around somewhere near a muscle, we would very much like it not to move whilst we're slicing through or twitch or anything like that. And so medicinal chemists took this as inspiration to develop a drug which was able to uh, paralyze uh, a muscle. It's a very useful thing. And they took the idea that if we have two cationic interactions at a certain space apart, then we can uh, mimic tubercurine, but actually with a molecule which is much simpler and cheaper to make. 
and uh, it, it was found that 10 carbon units as a spacer was optimal and, uh, and this indeed is a drug used in surgery. It's a very good muscle relaxant, um, however it's very very long lasting because of this effect that if one end goes on the other one comes off but it's probably most likely to go on and it can last days. Um, which is great, I guess, if you're doing very complicated surgery, but not so good if you need to regain the use of that muscle afterwards. And in particular, a problem here was that um, it wouldn't, <clears throat> it would get into the bloodstream and go around the body and find other um, receptors in the heart in particular in which it would interact and it would increase heart rate and lower blood pressure, which are not good side effects uh, in these sorts of circumstances. So, as medicinal chemists will often take inspiration from nature, and we know that acetylcholine itself uh, is broken down, and so they thought, well, what if we join two acetylcholines together? We can then use the acetylcholine esterase uh, enzyme to break it down. And that's exactly what happens. So if we join them head to head, We've still got the same spacing between the two cations, um, but now we've got these ester linkages here which can get broken down, and indeed that, that works. So now the duration of activity is five or ten minutes, much easier, you can always administer a bit more as you're doing your surgery, but it means that it doesn't uh, <coughs> block up the receptors and it's broken down quicker um, after the surgery. Okay, so this is... Uh, uh, the drug as used in hospitals today. So there are a lot of different <coughs> natural substrates for these acetylcholine receptors. And uh, some are agonists, some are antagonists, and we'll look at those as we go through the lecture. So uh, very briefly, an agonist mimics the natural substrate and provokes the same response, whereas an antagonist just blocks the site and stops the natural ligand uh, making the response. So in terms of nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, then this is generally uh, one will cause a contraction, the other one will just block and cause a dilation of the muscle. So it's found that uh, a subset um, of these acetylcholine receptors uh, <coughs> could be uh, um, more receptive to muscarine, which comes from these uh, toadstools, and a different subset were uh, active against uh, with nicotine. And so there the then became a, a sort of subclassification. And most of the things which I'll talk about today act on the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. So <coughs> agonists are just drugs. In, in some surgeries, it would be nice to regain um, muscle control after surgery, and in particular bladder surgery, the last thing you want is a colostomy bag forever. Um, and so these uh, very uh, simple compounds have been developed for exactly that. They mimic the natural ligand, acetylcholine, but they get hydrolyzed much more slowly. So they're removed much more slowly from the synaptic gap, meaning that there's a much longer sort of muscle contraction uh, going on, and therefore you regain that, that uh, muscle control uh, more because the, the, the muscle is being activated more. Um, so <clears throat> I don't know if there are any first year chemists in the audience but this is a beautiful example of very simple first year uh, organic chemistry. So we've got an acetate group, if you replace the carbon with the nitrogen we now have a lone pair which is feeding into the carbonyl group, it's less delta positive, uh, it's therefore hydrolyzed much slower by, by water. Here we have a simple steric block, an extra methyl group, so attack at this position is slightly hindered, uh, and so it's slower, and here we have the combination of the two things. So there are a number of other um, natural ligands of the acetylcholine receptors, uh, and these uh, are ones which I've been interested in uh, during my career as an academic. So uh, <clears throat> I showed you earlier two molecules um, that I was making in my, in my undergraduate days and my PhD days. Uh, so now if we fast forward to the last year of my PhD, I'd uh, secured a postdoc position in Texas uh, for a guy called uh, um, Phil Magnus. And he said, well, Rob, uh, you know, I've got the money, you can come, but there's this travel award. 
that you could possibly apply for. Um, why don't you do that and see if you can get your own money to come? So I thought, okay, let's, let's have a look at this. Read the rules and you had to write a proposal. And uh, the proposal had to be uh, linked vaguely to uh, the work of the, the professor that you're going to go and work for. So I read loads of his papers and found a paper where he tried, uh, he'd done a model uh, study on this molecule here, hysterinic toxin, in the, in the late 1980s, but he'd never finished it. So I thought, well, that's a, that's a nice looking molecule. Um, I'll write a proposal around that based on the synthesis of it. It's kind of related because he, he once worked on it. <coughs> so uh, these molecules are quite interesting um, species. So they come from these very highly uh, poisonous frogs. So again, these are poison dart compounds. Uh, and this particular one isn't um, as bad as some of the, the compounds which um, work at this receptor. And that's because this actually works at a um, so-called umbrella receptor. It doesn't work directly at the acetylcholine receptor. Um, and so biochemists like this molecule because if you accidentally uh, get some in you, it's not going to kill you. Whereas a lot of the natural ligands, um, like uh, one you'll see in a minute, uh, certainly will. Um, but nonetheless, you can use it to arrest neurotransmission and therefore probe uh, how, how um, uh, neurotransmission works. So the original isolation came from over a thousand frogs. And these are an endangered species nowadays. I don't know if that's because of the natural product isolation or, or, or what. Um, <coughs> But nonetheless, there, was, there seemed some sort of compelling reason that biochemists use it. You can't get it from the natural source. Uh, that these frogs are found in Colombia. That has all sorts of export issues. Um, so it seemed like a nice compound to, to have a look at. And I really like the structure of this compound. So this is, uh, this is the, the proposal I came up with. Long before... Um, <coughs> the lack of protecting group chemistry became uh, fashionable. I thought, well, I don't like protecting group chemistry. It wastes steps. Um, if we connect the nitrogen and the oxygen here, um, then, then they're protecting each other. And that reveals this isoxazolidine. And you could disconnect this to give a nitrone cycloaddition. And that nitrone, I knew that Ron Grigg had done some work where you can form these nitrones through a conjugate addition reaction. So for those non-chemists in the audience, I promise this will be, there's a couple of slides of hardcore chemistry in here, and then I'll go back to more general stuff. But once we've disconnected to this level, we've now got three methylenes here, three here. It's symmetrical. There's a hidden symmetry in this molecule. So there I was. <coughs> I wrote this up, got some money, wonderful, went off to Texas. But this idea of hidden symmetry really intrigued me. And so when I became an academic, uh, I guess 14, 13 years ago now, um, I needed something to do. And I thought, well, let's go see if this works. Um, and in actual fact, this sort of idea of, of using symmetry um, within synthesis has been with me ever since. Uh, so here's the, um, the, the second generation synthesis, if you like, of this molecule. The very first synthesis of this molecule uh, was done in the, in the 70s by Kishi, and it took 38 steps. Not quite 39. That would have been nicely poetic, wouldn't it? Um, <coughs> so uh, I won't go through this, but um, <coughs> in just four steps, we can get to the core structure. And we can use this idea of a symmetrical molecule um, going through a reaction, and it desymmetrizes itself by changing the type of reactivity of this central piece. So we go from an oxime that does a conjugate addition to one side of the molecule. That reveals a nitrone, and it does a cycloaddition to the other side of the molecule. It, it changes the type of reactivity at that central position. And that's how it, it desymmetrizes itself as we go along. Turns out that if we go through to here, we actually get the wrong regioisomer of that cycloaddition. Uh, but you can force it to go backwards and go to the thermodynamic product by heating a sealed tube. Um, 
so I guess this was, oh, I don't know, 10 years ago or thereabouts, and uh, I published this. The, the first sentence of this is my first and only uh, single author paper so far. Um, and it dropped out really, really very quickly. But um, it was spotted by Phil Fuchs um, in the United States, and he's quite a famous chemist. I'd certainly heard of him as an undergraduate in the Corey Fuchs reaction, so I was quite surprised to hear from him. And he said, well, um, I really like your core structure synthesis, um, but I've got a really good solution to put the enines on the end of the molecule. Uh, could you send me some of your material over? So that's exactly what happened. And uh, we sent him some of this. And his uh, PhD student, Mahesh, uh, did the next uh, sequence and finished the total synthesis. Um, <clears throat> so he did this using the, the Corey Fuchs type of reaction to make an alkene, and then double elimination to make the alkyne. And I guess these are some very old Barton conditions to, to remove the chlorines and break the NO bond. Uh, so that was really nice. So from 38 steps, this synthesis overall uh, was nine steps. So it tells you about the, the complexity generating power of this sort of symmetrical and desymmetrizing approach to synthesis. And as I say, that, that sort of stuck with me uh, for, well, ever since. So another natural ligand, <coughs> and now we're probably about six, seven years ago in my career, in my career is uh, anatoxin A. And this, this story I put in here because it, it, um, it came out of me teaching retrosynthesis to undergraduates. And this is the, the concept of a retrosynthesis is to take a, a target molecule and be able to go backwards, tear it backwards and, and, and figure out a synthetic sequence to make it. And it's a really difficult thing to teach retrosynthesis. It's a logic puzzle essentially but you need to know all the forward steps before you can think backwards. <coughs> so it is really quite a difficult thing uh, to teach. And so because of that, I decided each year to give the students uh, a, a molecule to, to do a retrosynthesis of, which had already been made in the literature. So for those people who found it really difficult to, to, to break it down backwards, at least they could, if they were diligent, go to the literature, find the synthesis and take some inspiration or indeed plagiarize uh, <clears throat> that synthesis and hand it in. And I said, look, you know, I know all the syntheses of this molecule, so if you're going to take inspiration, shall we say, from the literature, then you need to cite it properly. So, <clears throat> but if you want the first class mark, you're going to have to come up with something original. So this was a nice, uh, nice challenge, I thought. Um, incidentally, this hand here belongs to a Professor Geoffrey Codd, who's at the University of Dundee. And uh, when he saw me giving a lecture once, <coughs> he said, my God, man, don't use that photograph. I was an absolute idiot doing this. So this is cyanobacteria. So it's called blue-green algae. Uh, it's, it's not algae, it's cyanobacteria. And he was scooping it up because this is where the anatoxin A comes from. It comes in fresh water, ponds around the country. If you see lots of very thick blue-green goo in there, don't let your dog swim in there if you're walking your dog. Don't go swimming in there yourself and certainly don't do things like this. Because if he had a cut in his hand, a tiny cut, some of this material could have got into his bloodstream and he would have died on the spot. When this was first isolated, it was called Very Fast Death Factor. And it's another suicide drug that the CIA used to use once upon a time. Um, <clears throat> they renamed it Anatoxin A after the Anabina Floss Aqua. Um, but the original isolation paper is in a bizarre journal called Lloyd's in uh, 1967. It's called Very Fast Death Factor. Uh, and and it, will, it will kill people in, in minutes. And, and actually, for if you're a spy who's been caught, being killed quickly is, is a good thing because you're going to get tortured uh, otherwise. So, <clears throat> so that's why it was used. These days, though, it's a possible lead for Alzheimer's. Uh, and so there are good reasons for, for making this material. Okay, so Steve Rowe <clears throat> was an undergraduate at the time. 
and uh, he, he handed in his coursework and he said, Rob, um, I've read some of your papers and you, you seem to like two-directional synthesis. So two-directional synthesis is where you start in the middle and you grow a chain in two directions at once. It generally makes symmetrical molecules. <coughs> and said, well, I've, I've done my um, coursework in the style of two-directional synthesis. And this is unusual from an undergraduate, um, or, or indeed from anyone, postgraduate. Uh, <coughs> and I thought, well, okay, I'm intrigued to know, and this is what he'd written down. So he too had spotted a hidden symmetry in this molecule. Uh, he'd disconnected here and here with a, a manic and a horner rodzer themans type of reaction to get these two pieces, and he'd spotted that this aminium species here was just a masked symmetrical dialdehyde. Absolute genius. And I was so impressed. I said, I, I reckon this might just work. Do you want to stay on and do a PhD? And we'll give it a go. So I won't go through the whole synthesis. <coughs> um, here's Steve. He now works for Celsius. Absolutely fantastic chemist. Really, really great chemist great brains and he's got a great pair of hands, which is really important in organic chemistry. Um, <clears throat> so Steve made a whole number of analogues. It worked. Not quite how it was written there. It took a while, um, but we, we did manage to do that. And uh, so these are th some of the analogues that we made, um, <clears throat> or Steve made along the way that happened to be crystalline. So these are nice x-ray structures of these compounds. Uh, and these have been passed on to various biologists to test uh, for, for potential use uh, in, uh, in biology and medicine. OK, so <clears throat> back to acetylcholine uh, receptor. Now antagonists. So sometimes you want to uh, paralyze a, a muscle, or in this case, um, an eye. But you actually want it not to, to tighten, not to contract, but to dilate. And uh, in particular, in eye surgery, opticians need to dilate the eye and, and stop it moving. And atropine is used in this case. So atropine comes from deadly nightshade, which, as the, the name suggests, it's not very good for you. Um, scopolamine is another uh, spy drug. This was used once again by the CIA um, <coughs> as, a, as a truth drug. Um, so this, this works uh, in the eye. This crosses the blood-brain barrier and gets into the central nervous system and starts messing about with the nervous system there and gives massive amount of disorientation. Apparently that makes the, uh, the in in interrogee um, much more likely to tell the truth. These days, of course, one would hope this sort of thing does not go on. Uh, atropine methanitrate was uh, a synthetic derivative of atropine to stop exactly this problem. The last thing you want as an optician is to dilate somebody's eyes and then they become disorientated and start telling the truth. And so if you deliberately quaternize this nitrogen, um, it's now too polar to cross the blood-brain barrier and it doesn't get into the central nervous system. So how on earth is this working? Well, it turns out that all you need is a certain distance between uh, the cationic interaction here and a hydrogen bond uh, acceptor down here. And so although we've got all this extra scaffolding on here, this mimics quite well the acetylcholine natural substrate. And if you look back uh, at histronicotoxin and anatoxin A, you can always find something where you get a quaternary ammonium species and a physiological pH and also a hydrogen bond acceptor. Okay, so acetylcholine esterase has also been used um, as both inspiration for chemical warfare agents and for, for drug development as well. Uh, and this is the molecule which goes around and, and chews up uh, the excess acetylcholine in, in the synaptic gap. And it works by having a tyrosine, so we've got a phenolic um, OH here, we've got a serine, this is a higher pKa um, hydroxy, and we've got a histidine up here, which is able to hydrogen bond. So this hydrogen bond activates the carbonyl 
This acts as a proton donor to this uh, hydroxyl down here, and this acts as the nucleophile. And you cleave off the acetate group, and the acetate group is then uh, removed from the acetylcholine esterase by water. The choline just uh, diffuses out of the uh, uh, system and gets recycled in, in the presynaptic terminal. So in the Second World War, because so much chemical warfare had gone on in the First World War, um, both sides <coughs> decided that they needed some more effective chemical warfare agents. And so they set about using acetylcholine as a template to develop some of these. And they developed nerve gases. So I can't remember which side developed these, but, but both the Nazis and uh, the, the Allies uh, developed uh, these side by side, completely uh, um, on opposite sides, but uh, um, they developed both of these. And luckily, chemical warfare wasn't used in the Second World War. This is obviously a good thing. Um, but nonetheless, these things had been developed. And you can see here, here's a bomb with these in. And these guys are wearing serious amounts of protection. These are nasty reagents. They absorb through your skin, through your eyes. You do not need very much to kill a human. And unfortunately, in 1990, probably around about the time <coughs> uh, most of you were born, um, these, uh, this particular one, sarin, was used by terrorists for the first time um, in an attack on the uh, Japanese underground. And of course, the underground is the worst place that you could possibly release uh, something like this because the air can't get out, it gets shoved around and lots and lots of people uh, were affected. Many collapsed, many died. Um, <clears throat> Saddam Hussein also used uh, some of these against uh, the Kurds who were in northern Iraq uh, during uh, his regime. But luckily, they have never been used by, um, <clears throat> in, in, in open warfare, as it were. So they work by deliberately going about and, and stopping acetylcholine esterase. They're inhibitors. They're, they're mechanistic inhibitors. So this, the uh, fluorophosphonate uh, comes in. It reacts in just the same way as acetylcholine does. But now the phosphorus-oxygen double bond uh, is a much stronger bond, so water cannot hydrolyze this. And of course, if you've got no active acetylcholine esterase in the synaptic gap, acetylcholine is constantly around, it's constantly telling muscles to contract, and again, you die a horrible death because your lungs stop working, uh, etc. <clears throat> um, of course, when major uh, governments develop nasty things, they want an antidote as well. So praldoxine was developed as an antidote. And this uses, again, uh, some nice uh, undergraduate organic chemistry thinking. Uh, if you want to make something more nucleophilic, we need super nucleophilic water. If you attach a heteroatom with another lone pair to the, to the water, or the hydroxyl in this case, then you, the alpha effect uh, that um, comes into play, so this lone pair repels these lone pairs, they become further away from the nucleus, more nucleophilic, and it's a much more nucleophilic thing than water. So in this case, we, um, the ammonium charge was built in to, to get this key interaction, to keep it in place, and it is able to uh, dephosphorylate and re-release the acetylcholine esterase. So luckily um, it wasn't used at that point, but it has been useful since for pesticide poisoning because pesticides were developed from nerve gases. And uh, <clears throat> obviously we need, if we want uh, to grow lots of crops, we need to kill the things which uh, eat the crops. And you can see, so this figure here the chloropyrifos comes from 1996, so I really ought to find some more recent data than this, but nonetheless, uh, a, a lot of this is made and used around the world. 
Um, and the reason is that the, this phosphorus double one sulfur means that it just gets very easily degraded in, in humans and uh, excreted. Uh, but in insects, there's a different type of enzyme called an insect oxidative desulfurization, which turns a phosphorus double one sulfur into a phosphorus double one oxygen. And that generates the active drug in situ. Humans don't have this enzyme. Um, so mammalian metabolism just, just uh, cleaves this <coughs> and you get uh, this non-toxic uh, byproduct. But in insects, we get the active drug and it kills the insect. And it's been very, very successful. But nonetheless, it does make you wonder if it's developed from nerve gas, just how safe these things are. I'm sure they go through enormous amounts of safety checks. Okay, so <clears throat> acetylcholine esterase inhibitors can also be used as drugs when we have a disease condition where there is too much acetylcholine esterase. And one such disease is Mycenae gravis. So this young lady here is not winking at you. She literally doesn't have the muscles in her face on that side of her face to open her eye. Um, and you can just about see that her, her mouth on that side is slightly down as well. And the reason for this is that she has too much acetylcholine esterase. She can't ever get enough acetylcholine in, in those receptors uh, to trigger the, the muscle to, to work. And so the muscle very slowly wastes away. And uh, <clears throat> if we have, if we use the same sort of ideas, the bladder uh, control um, drugs that we saw earlier, then if we can take out some of that act, extra acetylcholine, the excess, then maybe we can restore the levels to a normal operating level. And neostigmine here was developed for exactly that sort of thing. So it comes in, it, it replaces the acetate with a carbamate group. This means it's slower to hydrolyze, around about 100 times slower to hydrolyze than the simple acetate. And so it just takes uh, some, but not all, of the acetylcholine esterase out of the system and helps to uh, help patients to regain control of muscles um, that, they, that uh, they couldn't control previously. Right, so I did <coughs> say that in World War I, uh, and I'm, oh, okay, I've got 15 minutes, I'm going a bit quick here, but um, there, were, there was a lot of chemical warfare. In fact, um, from both sides. So the very first uh, incident of chemical warfare happened in 1915 uh, and it was the British Army who decided to release chlorine gas and it's a it's a really big step to use chemicals even in those days <coughs> it was a really big step and the reason was that uh, for years or I guess in 1915 for about 18 months uh, two armies had been at loggerheads they dug trenches, so they're in the fields of Belgium and northern France. They were hundreds of yards apart, and in the past 18 months, they'd gone nowhere. Every now and again, you would hurl loads, and literally millions, of shells over at the other side, and your troops would get up and try and run across this mud, and believe me, you'll see in a minute, it was extraordinary mud. It had been churned up by so many bombs, it was, it was like a lunar landscape. Mud would come up to your waist, you would, it would be very slow progress, and of course, you would just get mown down by machine guns, and that was the end of that. And so, times got desperate. <clears throat> uh, neither side had progressed more than 100 yards or, or more in, in a year or more. Stretch of areas across the soldier, maybe more people 
some of the donkey uh, truck to take him there, the nurses and whatnot after that. So for that, instead of one dead soldier, suddenly you're taking five, six, ten more people out of the opposing army. Um, and you multiply that by hundreds or thousands, and you can quickly see that actually maybe people might be a more effective warfare tactic than simply killing the enemy. But at least this was the thinking at the time. And uh, <coughs> well, the first foray by, by the British Army was to release the following guns. Uh, that didn't work out very well because they got the wind direction wrong and it blew back in their face. Um, this guy, Fritz Haber, you may have heard him, no more about it, the Haber process uh, was one of Nobel Prize winner, but he, he developed this compound here called mustard gas. And you've probably all heard of mustard gas. Uh, it's called that because that's the colour. It's the colour of the mustard, the colour of your jungle stuff. Um, <coughs> it, it's odorless stuff, it doesn't smell like that. It is utterly, utterly nasty. So it's a very heavy uh, gas, it really is a low boiling liquid. Uh, so it, it would roll over into the trenches, it would stick in the soil, and it would hang around for weeks. Uh, once it got on you, it alkylates you. So the sulfur displaces the chlorine to form spionium. That alkylates DNA or many other things. If it got in your airways, it would alkylate and blister all your lungs and airways. It blistered your skin. It was utterly, utterly horrible. It would take, it would be a painful death, and it would take four or five weeks to die of mustard gas poisoning. It was an utterly appalling thing. So, um, <coughs> well, there's a story about uh, the Nobel Prizes I've given there. Um, but I deeply hope you chemists out there, if you're ever in that position, and it would be an appalling position to be told by your government to go and develop chemical warfare agents, um, I, I hope nobody is, but my goodness, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'd rather kill itself than kill millions of people. Um, let's hope no one ever has that choice ever again. So you can see here <coughs> somebody who's been affected by mustard gas, and it is really horrible. Um, <coughs> but nonetheless, there is a link to medicine. So that link comes in the Second World War, actually. Um, so although there wasn't any chemical warfare in the Second World War. Nonetheless, uh, the Allies couldn't predict if Hitler was going to deploy chemical warfare agents. And so um, they had a ship um, in, a, in a liberated port in Italy uh, loaded up with 100 tonnes of mustard gas just in case Hitler decided to, to start using chemical warfare. Well, uh, one unfortunate night, there was an air raid and the harbour was attacked and the ship got blown up and it released its payload. And the local citizens and soldiers uh, were affected. And <clears throat> upon treating these, these people who had been affected, um, medics found that actually uh, white blood cell count was uh, considerably decreased. And at the time, there were some American academics who had been studying uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma, in which they found that white blood cell count in that case was, was massively increased. And the medics put two and two together and thought, well, perhaps, perhaps there's a treatment here somewhere. And obviously, you don't want to give some anyone mustard gas, quite frankly. Um, and so that led them to develop, and just all kinds of develop, uh, similar complex called nitrogen. And these were the very first anti-cancer compounds. So the idea is very, very similar. The nitrogen of these nitrogen mustards can form a similar type of uh, reactive species that can cross with the DNA. Um, and this works really because this aromatic ring here, the benzene ring, is able to uh, moderate the reactivity of the, the lone pair of nitrogen. It's involved in resonance. And so it really tames the reagent. You can tune it to, to be as reactive as you like. So, Harambe uh, still here is, is, is still used uh, rarely um, as an anti cancer agent. There were 
works by forming this three numbers of zero delineum <coughs> DNA, attacks it, there's another little zero delineum formed, and it can cross link the DNA. And it actually acts as binding residue of this position here. And <coughs> when you cross link DNA, the DNA can't replicate. Uh, very, very, very simply, uh, DNA replication is a bit like a zipper. So you've got two strands, the zipper goes down, it splits the two strands apart, and another zipper comes along and zips, uh, makes in fact another strand to complement that DNA go the other way. But of course, if you've cross linked the DNA, the zipper coming down just gets stuck, and so it can't uh, replicate and self, uh, self destructs. So <clears throat> this type of chemotherapy uh, works because you try and kill rapidly uh, dividing cells. Cancer cells are rapidly dividing, as are others uh, in the body. So you try and kill cancer before you kill the patient, essentially. They're not selective in any way at all, but you hope you kill the most rapidly uh, dividing cells. So the fairly crude, but that was the first Okay, so <clears throat> now on to the final, I guess, story. Um, I, I don't know if this is necessarily chemical warfare, but it's a chemical that was used in warfare. It's nitroglycerin, uh, invented by um, Alfred Nobel, of Nobel Prize fame. Um, <laughs> he invented dynamite. And uh, glycerol, which is the trial um, here, which is nitrated to form nitroglycerin, it is just a plant fiber. Very readily available. In fact, these days it's, it's a rather uh, big uh, side product of various processes. And you found if you nitrate it, then you get this compound here, nitroglycerin, uh, which is very explosive. And it's explosive because when it, uh, when you combust something, um, you need oxygen, you get CO2 out from carbon, you get nitrogen or nitrous oxide, and there's nitrogen in there. But here we don't need any extra oxygen. It's got enough oxygen in it to completely convert all these carbons into CO2 and nitrogen uh, as well to, uh, uh, to come out. These are all gaseous side products. So you go from uh, uh, liquid to gas, and a mole of liquid might be uh, a small amount, but a mole of gas is 22 litres. So you get a massive expansion of gas and that easily exploding. Um, <coughs> so dynamite works, it, it doesn't need any extra oxygen to burn or anything to explode. The problem was, and always was, he didn't invent uh, uh, nitroglycerin, um, that, that it's a very uh, fractious liquid. If, if you had it in a truck and you went over a stone and it bumped, the whole truck would blow up. Um, it's very shock sensitive. His genius is to think, well, okay, if I absorb this liquid onto uh, some dead earth, and <clears throat> I put that dead earth on a bit of paper, and I'll put another bit of paper on more dead earth, I'll make a nitroglycerin in the sanya, and I'll roll it up into a tube, and I'll get a dynamite stick. And it turns out when it's on, absorbed onto a, a sort of absorbing material, um, which <clears throat> soon lights, what I'm going to call it these days then it became a lot less shock sensitive. And of course, the uh, patterns of that became a very, very rich man. He invented it, dynamite, because of the mining industry. So you want to get coal out of the ground, or gold, or diamonds, or whatever it is. Obviously, if you can just blow the box up, they become much smaller, much easier to get at it, you don't have to dig the big holes. Uh, but of course, it, it obviously exposes, became very, very useful for warfare. And uh, there's a story, and uh, I was watching uh, QI one night, and, and Stephen Fry informed me on this program that this story is not true. I wonder if I'll tell it, because it's really nice, I think. <coughs> uh, so the story goes um, that he was sat down having his breakfast one day, and he opened the newspaper, and years before Mark Twain did the same, he wrote his obituary. And uh, it turned out he was his brother. Not himself, uh, but the journalist had got it wrong. And the obituary said, inventor of dynamite, <coughs> and went on to list all the wars that it had been used in, and how many millions of people, thousands of people, 
uh, that are involved in those wars. And I thought, oh my God, what an appalling legacy. Now I'm rich as hell, but what a legacy to leave. And so he decided at that point to um, set up a prize for peace because he didn't want his name associated with war and for science because he was a scientist. And uh, indeed, these days, his name is synonymous with the ultimate prizes in science uh, and indeed peace. And so it worked. People have forgotten that he was a dynamite. And the connotations that that came from. Uh, so dynamite also uh, <coughs> spawned uh, the DuPont chemical company. Uh, so although he patented uh, the absorbance of this onto a dynamitious earth, um, and obviously the states, uh, the sky was a pediment, decided, well, okay, well, I'll put ammonium nitrate in there, and then it breaks the pattern. Ammonium nitrate's not quite as explosive as, uh, as dynamite, but it's, it's still very explosive. And he patented that, and it's called dynamite extra. And, uh, but that spawns the DuPont industry, which now is famous for things like Teflon. So, <coughs> in not 1917, so we go back to the First World War again, uh, around the Ypres salient, as it was called in Belgium, uh, chemical warfare had been going on, well, that, that didn't solve any problems either. Um, <coughs> It was still at loggerheads. In three and a half years, things had gone nowhere. Still, they were 100 yards apart, still in the same place. And so, yet another crazy plan came into play. So, 600 tonnes of this known dynamite were used in the Zenith Ridge mines in 1917. So, <coughs> what happened? Uh, and this just is a, a picture of, of that sort of no man's land. You'd be utterly, if you stepped in this, you would sink up to your waist in mud. Impossible to traverse by that stage. It looks like nothing on earth, quite frankly. Um, <coughs> so Ypres in this part of Belgium, there's a line in the back from here all the way down through France where there was just no progress whatsoever. And Ypres is, is on a very flat piece of land, and then there's a kind of ridge of very low hills around it. And Germans have been uh, incumbent on these hills for all three years, and they dug themselves in and made concrete bunkers. The British refused to allow their troops to make concrete bunkers, always believing that their residence would be only temporary. And so you build a temporary bunker, if you build a concrete bunker, there forever, and your soldiers won't get up and try and move forwards. <coughs> Concrete bunkers are much stronger than temporary wooden ones, uh, and it's a failed plan. So, uh, 25 mines were laid. Uh, in total, 600 tons of dynamite. Various positions along the Zeman's Ridge. And on the 17th of June at 5.15am, they were all detonated. Simultaneously. Uh, so they used coal miners to dig long trenches underneath no man's land and up underneath the German positions. You go back and you can see the tunnel. This is a crater left by one of those mines. They're very large indeed. Um, the whole hill exploded essentially in each case. So 25 miles of lane. 19 went off. Um, <coughs> two or three others were, were later found after the war and deliberately detonated. There's still two or three undetonated somewhere under Belgium. In 1957, a lightning strike detonated one and some cows went flying. <laughs> <coughs> so these are massive, massive explosions, the biggest explosions. And it worked, actually. Uh, over the next two or three days, the Allies went about 10 miles. So it really made a massive difference. And it really significantly weakened the German army. It was a very, very, <coughs> a very big shock. It didn't lead 
to the eventual uh, treaty uh, on the defeat of the German army, because about six months later they regained that whole 10 mile stretch. But nonetheless, it was quite an extraordinary um, event. So, <coughs> obviously, a lot of. Uh, so, <coughs> let's. Uh, so, this compound is also um, uh, related. But before I go and tell you about this, I will tell you about. Well, actually, no, I'll tell you about this first. Okay, so, uh, <coughs> this is the, the so called pants bomber. Rather unfortunate uh, moniker that he will always be remembered for. So he used PETM, which is obviously very related to dynamite. Uh, uh, so this is actually a heart medicine. So it turns out um, in the DuPont factory and also in the factories which uh, make dynamite in uh, Sweden and the world, um, people who worked in those factories had a very short life expectancy when they retired. It was so they work in the factory perfectly happy for years and years and years. And nearly all of them died within months of leaving that job of heart attacks. And the reason was that <coughs> nitroglycerin and PETN as well, they released nitrous oxide, and that's a vascular dilator. So they've been exposed to nitroglycerin. Uh, and these days, Viagra works in the same way. Places. <clears throat> and uh, of course, when they didn't have their daily dose of nitroglycerin, uh, their arteries tightened up and the heart wasn't used to pumping that high pressure. And they had heart attacks. Uh, so now nitroglycerin is used for treatment of people who had heart attacks to, to give, you know, allow the arteries to expand and give their hearts a much easier time. Uh, it's also used uh, as a topical treatment for something called Raynaud's disease. Um, so some people have very painful hands and you can run nitroglycerin on the topical formulation to, to relieve uh, that pain. Uh, so PETN is, is called the Tonitrax, so it was developed as a, as a more effective uh, um, drug, um, but also it is an explosive. <coughs> and it's used by uh, this gentleman here in the air bomb. Unfortunately, he wasn't a very good chemist. He tried to use a chemical um, method for uh, igniting this bomb. And uh, the toilet trap needs e either a very um, large amount of heat, 800 degrees, or it needs uh, some sort of large shock, like an electrical shock. Um, or sort of, um, <coughs> it's not quite as impact and explosive as it is. So unfortunately, all he did was uh, burn himself. It, it caught fire, but it didn't explode. Luckily, you know, that's the most fire. Okay, so I told you about that. Now. So overall, we've seen how we can use chemical warfare agents, and often they lead to um, inspiration for, for medicinal chemists to uh, develop new drugs. And just to bring it back to my own career. Um, we used the two-directional approach over, over the past how uh, long, 12, 13 years, to make all sorts of different natural products. So I'm uh, really interested in, in making compounds which nature makes, but nature makes often in very small quantities, which could be used as potential therapeutics or tool molecules in biology. So we've made antitoxin A, uh, which is a chemical warfare agent. We've made some other related compounds which also work in the same sort of way. All of these compounds, in fact, uh, these natural products work in the cotinic acetylcholine receptor. Um, <clears throat> but more recently, because of the funding situation, um, in, uh, we've become more and more uh, involved in early stage drug discovery. So the tools we've used, tools we've developed because of natural products in this case, we thought, well, could we apply these to early stage drug discovery? At the moment, there's a renaissance uh, in, the, in the pharmaceutical industry in looking towards natural product like compounds, not as complicated as these compounds here, but nonetheless, as starting points for the drug discovery. 
And so we set ourselves the challenge. Um, we use this particular substrate because it had been used, we've used it many times before. We thought, well, how many different tandem reactions can we can get out of this? Um, how many, how many molecular architectures can you make in one step from this material? And we came up with like 12. So you can see they give all sorts of different shapes. And this is what you want in early stage drug, drug discovery, it's just a scaffold with a two or three different connection points where you can append different things. But they want these to be presented in a variety of different vectors because you, you don't know what you're going to screen against. You're going to screen against a whole range of diseases. But you want the groups to be presented in a variety of different three-dimensional uh, vectors. And uh, so <coughs> we did this work and uh, we can get 12, 12 different scaffolds and 15 reactions in total um, because of the, uh, the efficiency and the complexity generation and power of this type of uh, approach to synthesis. And just to prove that we'd, uh, we could indeed access biologically relevant chemical space, we took one of those and we made very small library and tested them against this uh, very simple cancer cell line and uh, found some activity. So, this is the sort of activity in some cases here. Um, but you can reasonably uh, do some more work to, to see if this really is a, a genuine need for drug discovery or um, just some that reason. Okay, so you can see over the years my career has gone from chemical warfare, saxotoxin as a PhD student, to, to early stage drug discovery at least. And uh, I hope you've uh, enjoyed this. I'll finish with um, I'll finish with this quote, which I really like, because as a chemist, it describes really what what I aim to do or what we aim to do. Um, so this is Charles Mendes, the jazz musician, and he said that anyone can make the simple complicated. Creativity is making the complicated simple. And as chemists, we want to make complex molecules in the most simple way possible. This is some of the group that I've had over the years that have done all the work um, for me. I've been very little. And uh, thank you for listening.